Uh, welcome, everyone, to our inaugural Android Developer Summit here at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. It's great to see so many Android developers here from some of the biggest names and emerging names all under one roof. Uh, and I also want to say uh, a big welcome to everybody who's joining us on the live stream today. OK, so speaking of history, um, I joined Google uh, in 2007. Um, and it was a time when computing was quite different. So the focus, really, of the company was really laptops and desktops. Um, and it was before mobile had really taken off. Um, and Larry and Sergey, the, the co-founders of Google, uh, to their credit, kind of foresaw how mobile was going to change how we interact with computers on a daily basis. And so they wanted to create a strategic investment in mobile. So we cre created a separate group within Google to focus on mobile applications. Um, and the goal of the group was to take existing Google apps and services and bring them to the mobile phones at the time. Now, remember, this was 2007, so it was a pretty different world. Uh, and in particular, there was no Android and there was no iPhone. Um, and the devices that were available at the time were quite primitive. So uh, you had a whole fragmentation of technologies across different device manufacturers. So you would see J2ME in one device maker. You would see Symbian. And then even within Symbian, there were two variants, UIQ and S60. You'd have Palm OS. You'd have Windows Mobile. And it was brutal as an application developer to have to target all of these different SDKs, because each one would have different capabilities and limitations. And what you would invariably find is that, because they're so different, you would have to hire application developers for each technology vertical. It was really, really tough. But we soldiered on, and we created a whole set of applications and services. So we had WAP versions of Google Search. We had HTML versions of Google Search. We used to have like radio buttons. You had to like tell Google whether you were searching for web or images. That was before we had something called universal search. Uh, we had J2ME versions of Maps. We had J2ME versions of YouTube, of Gmail, et cetera. Uh, even within Google Maps, it, not only did we have J2ME versions, we had a Windows Mobile version, we had a Series 60 version, we had a UIQ version, we had a Palm OS version, we had a HTML version. It was very, very tough. And it was very, very tough to scale, even, even for a company with the resources uh, like Google. So we needed something better, uh, which then brought us to Android. Um, and at the time, you know, when, when analysts would hear about the Android project, they would sort of criticize it, and they would be like, OK, this is the last thing the world needs is yet another mobile operating system. Um, and Andy Rubin, who started the Android project, he would agree, but he would say what the world needs is an open source mobile operating system. And so with Android, we also want a platform that has the application developer in mind. So we spend a lot of time worrying and thinking about our API design to make sure that we have a really good application framework. Uh, every year when we do a dessert release, we, we run what we call API Council. And it's a group of core engineers on the team. And they review all the prospective new APIs, all the method names, all the, the property names, all of the, uh, all of the sort of styles that people are using across the team. And we make sure that we have one consistent style. So if you're writing an application and you're interacting, say, with our Camera 2 APIs, and then you're talking to sensor manager to read uh, sensor readings, or you're manipulating your view hierarchy, we want it to feel like it's one person had designed those APIs for you. Uh, even more important is making sure that we have consistency of those APIs across different devices. And so the way we do that is we have something we call a compatibility definition document. And it's a document describing all of the requirements that a compatible device must exhibit. And it's backed by hundreds of thousands of tests that we call the compatibility test suite. And so if you're a device maker and you want to make an Android device, you have to pass these hundreds of thousands of tests to be able to use the Android brand and for your device to be able to access the Play Store. And what this does is it ensures that you as an application developer can target applications that work across a variety of device makers. And then you as a user can download apps and have certainty that the app will run well on your device. So CTS is, is an ongoing project. We're constantly investing in it. Uh, in just the last 12 months, we've added over 80,000 OpenGL tests, for example. Um, and this allows us to test some of the very latest features in OpenGL right up to 3.1. Um, and it ensures that if you're a game developer and you're using those latest features in OpenGL, we can make sure that they're going to work well on modern devices. 
So, uh, of course, now uh, what, what this enables other people, not only third parties, but even Google's first parties, we can now use Google, Android's public APIs to deliver very advanced services, things like navigation on Google Maps or, uh, or VR with cardboard. Uh, and these are features that would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible, on previous platforms. So, so what's happening now? Well, effectively, we're in the midst of a mobile revolution. Uh, we just announced last month over 50% of Google searches are now happening on mobile. And for me, having started in 2007, this is an incredible number to see. I remember we would look at traffic graphs, and we would literally see mobile was like this little blip, uh, whereas now it's, it takes up half of the, of, of the area. Um, and of course, Android is on a tear. We have over 1.4 billion 30-day active users across uh, all uh, form factors. Um, and it, you know, a lot of that is also thanks to you guys, because you know, a platform without applications is not a product. Um, and so thank you for all of the work that you guys do. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting you know, when you think about it, because over the next couple of years, especially in emerging markets, people who don't have phones are going to be getting phones, and all phones are going to become smartphones. It's just an amazing transition to be a, a part of. Um, and you know, some people actually predicted this. I love this quote. This is from uh, Nikola Tesla in 1926. And he talks about you know, being able to communicate with each other instantly, right, irrespective of distance. He talks about being able to uh, see each other perfectly as though we were face to face. And he talks about devices being amazingly simple. Um, you know, he finishes up and he says, a man will be able to carry one in his vest pocket. I mean, this is very prescient. I mean, he obviously didn't anticipate that women would like phones, but he can't be perfect. This was 90 years ago. Hopefully, we've moved on. Uh, but it's pretty amazing to see. Um, now, of course, uh, mobile technology is advancing super fast. Um, and on the Android team, we like to have a very fast pace. Um, and so if I just look, take a little walk down memory lane, so in 2009, we launched, we actually had three dessert releases in one year. So we did Cupcake, we did Donut, we did uh, Eclair. And even in those three releases, we, we released some pretty uh, profound at the time features. So we had third party replaceable keyboards, for example. We had voice search uh, available. Um, we had desktop class browsing. Then in 2010, we did two more releases. We did Froyo and we did Gingerbread. And we introduced uh, additional features like uh, NFC and Wi Fi hotspot and the native development kit for targeting games. Uh, then in uh, the next year, we did Honeycomb, an ice cream sandwich. So Honeycomb allowed us to bring Android to tablets. Ice Cream Sandwich then introduced a more refined UI with the hollow theme and also introducing the Roboto font for the first time, which you'll now see everywhere on Android. Fast forward, then we had Jelly Bean, then we had Kit Kat, which then brings us to our two most recent releases, uh, Lollipop and Marshmallow. So with Lollipop, this was an opportunity for us to expand the categories of computing that Android could run on. So we introduced support for wearables, for watches, for TV, and for Android Auto in cars. And then this year, we introduced Marshmallow. And the focus there was to go back to the core user experience and set a high bar for the, what we believe a quality experience and polished experience on mobile should be. Uh, just uh, last year, we started a, a, a developer preview process um, and further refined it this summer. So with Marshmallow, we came out with a set of preview releases across the summer. Um, and even in the first couple of days, we had hundreds of thousands of downloads. And so what that means is that hundreds of thousands of developers can start testing out their applications on the newest version of Android before the release. And you can also try the new features. So it's really awesome because it means we're all working together to have the best platform releases and the best quality apps and services at launch for our users. OK. Um, so moving forward, that was a little bit about timing. Um, we started to think about, well, what else could we do to make your lives a little bit easier and more productive? What is it that you spend all your time doing? Uh, now, Android Studio is the official Android IDE and tool chain for, for Android, uh, directly from Google. And it has the best set of tools to help you build better, more successful apps. This year, we've made a huge stepwise change in investment in our tools. Um, and we're working on some really great features that are rolling out both this year and you'll see over the next coming months and years. I'm really excited about what we're doing. And to help you learn more, I'd like to invite Steph up to the stage to talk to you about Studio.
Thank you guys so much for being here today. Android Studio has built tremendous momentum since we announced it about two and a half years ago. Since we announced, we've had 103 releases into our various channels. Now that includes Canary, Beta, and Stable. Android Studio went G8, came out of beta just about a year ago, and since then we've had another five major stable releases. The last two focused very heavily on quality and stability. In the Android Studio team, our goal is to make the IDE delightful. And in order to be delightful, we felt like it had to be not just stable, but incredibly stable. And that's because as a developer, you spend hours in the IDE every day. And so in 1.4 and 1.5, we felt like with those significant investments, while we'll continue to make investments in stability and quality in every release, we had the foundation that we wanted to start setting our sights on the next set of improvements, which are really going to focus on speed. Now when we took a look at the feature set we had planned for the next release, we decided it was so gigantic that we wanted to renumber the release. So you'll see the next version of Android Studio will be Android Studio 2.0. Now this is a gigantic release. I'm going to walk you through some of the feature set today. When we talked to mobile developers, there was a few things we found, particularly that there were a number of opportunities to make the development process faster, smoother, and better. In particular, when we talked to mobile developers, like all developers, we found that you spend a ton of time, we spend a ton of time in the code build run cycle, right? That's where you spend all your time. And now, if you think about what it's like to code on HTML, you make some code edits, and then you can refresh the page live, right? So it's super fast. Now, how many of you guys would say it feels that way on mobile? <laughs> we felt like it was just too slow. It was too heavyweight, and you had to be able to iterate better. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of changes. The first thing you'll see coming is we've massively accelerated build speeds. So in 2.0, full build, the first time you build, will be two to two and a half times faster than it was. So if before your build was taking you a minute, now it's going to be about 20, 25 seconds. Now, I know a lot of you guys know, too, uh, after you do a full build, then of course you do an incremental build. That's when you uh, do the second set of changes, build a second time. Incremental build speeds are going to be even faster than that. They're going to be in the single digit seconds, and I'm going to come back to that and talk about it more. So the next thing I want to talk about is the emulator. In the code build run cycle, in order to iterate, you need to be able to quickly see how the app looks as well. Now, a lot of you guys in the community talked to us about our emulators, and here's what you said. They are not fast enough. They are not stable enough. We listened to you guys, and the truth was you were right. So we've made massive improvements here in 2.0. We have made major changes. And let me just start by talking about speed, because I really feel like it's the most important. In 2.0, one of the first things you'll find is that they are significantly faster. We have ADB push speeds that are five times faster for the emulator than they are on a physical device. We've massively accelerated I.O. We've massively accelerated CPU. So we're also adding SMP support to take advantage of host multi-core architecture. You will find overall that the emulators are massively faster than they were before. Uh, we, um, we'd also say the emulators continue to include Google Play services. So a ton of the developers in the audience here today and worldwide use Google Play services to get access to things like AdMob, Maps, authentication, and those will all be present just as you'd expect. Now, in addition to significant speed improvements, we also completely rewrote the UI. So you'll see major changes here. And uh, in 2.0, you'll have screen rotation, screenshots, windows, zooming of the emulator window. You'll be able to take an APK and drag and drop it onto the emulator. I will say a personal favorite of our engineering director and one that he pushed really far for, a couple of you guys in the audience asked us for the ability to grab the edge of the emulator and pull it down and back to resize it. And you will also find that in two hours. So that's not all. You're going to find you'll have the ability to emulate GPS location. So you can pass in a single point. You can pass in a set of points like, you know, me walking over to the keynote today. You can emulate calls. You can emulate texts. You can emulate camera. You can emulate, emulate battery state. So you want to see how your app's going to perform when the battery's full or really drained. 
So overall, a very, very significant set of changes in the emulator. Again, the reason why we felt this was so critical is you have to be able to iterate in your app and fast. And every minute that you're sitting around, you're waiting for builds, you're waiting for run speed, that's a minute wasted. So with 2.0, the IDE is designed to help you stay constantly in the flow while you're coding. So you can iterate and try things out on a single device. Now, one of the things Dave talked about is we have 1.4 billion active users on Android. And so that means there's also a ton of devices out there. And that was another reason why we felt the emulator was so important. So you could test not just on the device that you have next to you, but across a multitude of devices. One of the things that we hear from developers everywhere is that the emulator is very important, but physical devices are important as well. And that's why we have decided to have world-class support for both. So let me talk about some more changes. Android also has a very important set of developers doing what I would call graphics-intensive apps. So this would be things like maps, games, video, things of this nature. We do a lot of it at Google as well. And so that's why in 2.0, we're also including a very early preview of our new GPU profiler and debugger. So one of the big problems with graphics intensive development is you'll see a scene and you get a problem. And you're not really sure exactly what caused it. So one of the things you'll find in the GPU profiler is you're able to record and replay the entire GPU stream frame by frame. So you can understand and debug into GL code. So now graphics developers can spend countless, uh, save countless hours when debugging graphics rendering problems. Another thing I want to talk about is core IDE improvements. Android is built on top of IntelliJ. And being built on top of IntelliJ means as fast as Android Studio itself has been innovating, IntelliJ's own incredibly rapid pace propels us even faster all the time. Now, IntelliJ released their newest version, 15, just about three weeks ago. And Android Studio 2.0 already fully integrates IntelliJ 15. You'll see that in the Canary builds. So there's a ton that comes with IntelliJ 15. One of the features I thought I would touch on in particular, because we care about it so much, is testing. Now, another thing we hear a lot from developers is how critical it is to be able to build high-quality apps by default. IntelliJ includes a wide range of new features for testing, including a test runner tool window. It's got inline statistics and test result history. You can right-click and then execute a test. And we've also added on that in Studio itself with a couple of key asks from the community. One of the things you guys asked us for is to be able to run all test types together. Now, as you guys know, in Android Studio, you can have two test types, unit tests and Android tests. And now you can have both of those active at the same time. One of the things that means, that's good. So one of the things that means, too, is you can now refactor seamlessly across your code. So you can make a change in app code, refactor it, it will go across all test types. All right. So I've talked so far about coding, talked about building, talked about IntelliJ and everything that we got from them. We've talked about debugging, testing. I want to touch on one final area, and that's uh, deployment and making your app discoverable. One of the things that we did in 2.0 was work very closely with the Google search team. They have a wonderful feature called deep linking, which allows you to expose your app so that it can be found in the Google search. But one of the key questions is, OK, how do I get this set up in my app? So we've added support for this in Android Studio 2.0. The first thing you'll find is something called intention actions. So what this means is you can go into Android Studio, and as you're in your code, it will suggest to you in line where you need to put code and actually expand and show you how to configure it. Now, the second thing we have is static analysis. So I'm sure you know, none of you guys in the audience, much like Dave Burke, have ever made coding mistakes. But I will be honest and say I make them frequently. So the uh, static analysis we have in 2.0 will check and make sure that your deep links are configured correctly. The third thing we've added is real-time testing. So that you can actually see whether Google can index and render the app pages correctly. <laughs> so, with Android Studio 2.0, we know we still have a couple of users out there who are using our Eclipse tools. And we wanted to say to you, there's really no better time than now to switch to Android Studio. <laughs> <laughs>
It is a massive speed improvement, and we believe it will significantly accelerate your development. A couple other things we'd say. Uh, Android Studio remains open source, free to all. And there's uh, just one more thing we had wanted to talk about while we were here. With development, I feel like one of the most amazing feelings is when you're in the flow. You're relaxed, you're coding, there's this timelessness where you're incredibly productive. And so it was in the interest of enabling developers to code like that that we created a new feature that is called Android Studio Instant Run. Instant Run is designed so that you can make changes in code or resources and they'll update into your live app near more or less instantly. So, <laughs> so as you're coding, you can press the run button and your changes will deploy live into the running app. And you're gonna find this is gonna take you on an average Android app about one to two seconds. Now we are still expanding the set of code changes that will be covered in Instant Run. You will find, uh, for those of you who watch the Canaries closely, and I know that's a lot of people in this room, it'll expand very rapidly over the coming weeks. But there's a few things that we felt like were important from the beginning. We know you guys are using a ton of emulators, you're using a ton of devices, and people out there are running phones with a lot of different versions of Android. So I'll say a couple of th about this, uh, a couple things about it from the outset. First. Instant Run will work on virtually every emulator in use today. Second, Instant Run will work on virtually every current physical device. And third, it will work on virtually every version of Android that has significant use today that is all the way back to Ice Cream Sandwich or API Level 15. The web really became successful in the early days because you could edit HTML, you could see how it looked on a browser right away. And now our goal is to bring a similar lightweight feel to mobile development. We're incredibly grateful for all the, the feedback from our community that's led us in this direction. We were talking about the feature beforehand and we were talking about Dave Burke. I think he's given you a cool overview of what the early days, the hard days looked like for Android development. And we thought it would be really neat to have Dave Burke come back up on stage and demo for you Android Studio 2.0 and Instant Run to get a feel for the new lightweight way to do mobile development. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dave Burke back to the stage. Thank you. All right, so we are, we'll switch to the developer machine here. Okay, cool. So preview version of the IDE live coding, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, <laughs> All right, so what I've got here is I've got a NVIDIA Shield. This is a live tablet, live physical tablet. Uh, we have a projecting picture in picture on top of here. Uh, I have the latest version of Android Studio 2.0. Uh, I have an app that uh, Roman Guy and uh, Matthias Ajopian helped me create. Uh, it's a chess game, and it's got some cool uh, physically based uh, lighting. Um, and what I want to do is show you a couple of things. I want to show you changing resources. I want to show you changing code. So if I change a resource, like an XML layout, what we're going to do, we call that a warm swap. We're going to upload the new resources, we're going to invalidate the frame caches, and then we'll restart the activity. Uh, but before I do that, let me just get the app running. So I'm going to go Control R. So the IDE is building the app, compiling it, it's uh, ADB installing it, the package manager is doing its thing, it's dex opting, um, and now it's going to run the app. So you know, it takes, takes a bit of time. Previously, in an old world, you'd, every time you made a code change, you had to go through that process. So here's how it looks with Android Studio 2.0. So let's say I want to change the background of this setting screen. So I go to my XML layout. Uh, and I want to add a background. So I've got a background bitmap that I want to add here. So I can just go Android background like so, uh, if I can type like that. And then I have a drawable set up. This is a preview of, uh, of Android <laughs> <laughs> Studio. <laughs> all right. All right, so we're all good. OK, so what's cool here is that uh, to run it, I just go Control R. It will send up the new, uh, OK, it's going to restart because I, I busted it. So we'll change this in a second. So let me, let, let me let this start again here. 
Okay, so you can see normally what would happen there is that would just restart the activity, which would not have a, cause a reinstall. So it's the same thing that happens when you rotate the screen. I'll change another resource. This time I won't mess it up, so you can actually see it work. <laughs> so uh, there's a, you can see it says new button there. I can change the string and I can say new game like this. Uh, da da da. Control R. Oh, okay. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna reset this. Hold on. One of the uh, one of the advantages of, of a live stream, by the way, is you can edit it after the fact and uh, <laughs> remove the thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uninstall this app. Did I? Okay. Okay. So I'm showing you what real development looks like. This is good. <laughs> so I'll leave new I'll leave new game there, right? And I'll go back here, and I will remove this line here, uh, like that. So, and now uh, we'll do a normal. Uh, uh, build and compile. So it's going to build and compile, and it's going to install it. It'll take a couple of seconds. Okay. Now it's running. So if I add this line back in here, uh, like so, and then I just do my control R, what it'll do is it'll just restart the activity. So you'll see a little flicker, and it just restarts like that. Okay. Now, much more interesting, so we call that a warm swap, right? So it's the same thing as rotating the screen. Much more interesting is when you want to do what we call a hot swap. Um, and the way this works is that we're instrumenting the code, and every time you compile, we run an analyzer and see if we can hot swap out the code at runtime. Um, and so we can change method implementations of a class on the fly. So if I go into the chess activity up here, and uh, so we have this on draw frame call. So this is getting called 60 times a second uh, to update the screen. Now, if I change something like, let's change these values here, and I change this value here. So what this will do is it will turn the uh, chessboard into a 3D uh, animated uh, uh, scene. So if I just go Control R, the code dynamically changes, and then boom, instantly it just updates like that. So uh, it turns out that I work in a company full of overachievers who are very good at chess, uh, and I need an advantage. So what I'm going to do is try to uh, find an advantage. Now, the first thing, anybody who watches rugby and has ever seen the All Blacks play from New Zealand will know the trick to winning is to intimidate your opponent. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and try to make my chess pieces larger. So I get the vertex mesh for my piece, my pieces. So I'm going to be, uh, let's see, uh, player one, I suppose. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Boom. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll iterate over each of my pieces like this. So P1 size, get all the chess pieces like that. And then what we'll do is we'll get uh, each of my pieces one by one with the index I. And then I have a convenience method to set the scale. And then I'll set that to, I don't know, 1.75 seems like a good intimidation factor uh, like that. And then control R, boom, and the gold pieces jump up like that. <laughs> Uh, so also to get an extra advantage, I think I'll make my opponents a little smaller, so I can just go <laughs> Command D like this. By the way, if you have not started using Studio, the autocomplete in this uh, ID is kind of amazing. Like, watch this. Boom, boom. It's super fast. So let's make my opponents 0 0.75. And of course, that's uh, player two. Control R, boom, and a little black guys get small. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, it turns out he's a squirrely little opponent, won't be easily intimidated. I need to have a more meaningful material uh, advantage. So what I'm going to do is get my pieces again. So I'm player one. And then I'm going uh, to set, oops, a little typo. So get, uh, get the pieces, so I. And then what I'm going to do is set the mesh. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the vertex mesh for uh, some more powerful pieces. So I guess I uh, get mesh, and then queen would be Good, and then I like the gold color, so we'll stick with that, and then hit a semicolon on there, and then Control R, boom, I am not going to win this game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's Instant Run. It's pretty awesome, uh, and that's available in the Canary Channel this morning, so you can try it out. It's a it's a preview build. Uh, okay, so. We have a packed set of days here at the Computer History Museum. If you're on the live stream, we've got 15 more hours of content. 
Um, on day one, we're going to focus on framework skills. Again, what's amazing here is we have the Android engineering team who built these features here. So you can learn so much from just talking to them. They're a friendly bunch, mostly, uh, especially when, after lunch when they've had their lunch. Uh, before, so, before lunch, not so much. Uh, day two, we're going to focus on tooling and performance. We're going to talk about some of the new features that we've added, like data binding. We're going to talk about some of the Android testing frameworks, the new Doze feature, and, and much more. We also have the self-paced tutorials outside uh, on lots of Android topics, everything from performance to writing uh, watch face faces for Android Wear. We'll also make those available to people uh, online later today so you can try them at home. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of the summit.